and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, one half of the dynamic duel that's responsible for Shiver. And now coming to coming to us with Don't Play This Game, which technically speaking will be the first solo RPG that I've covered on this channel. The one and only Charlie Menzies. How you doing today, man? Hello, you know, I'm very good. Thank you for welcoming me back to the temple. It's very good to be back. Yeah, thank thank you for coming in. Oh. So normally I'd start with the humble beginnings, but we've already done that with you. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, instead, walk me through how this was, how this particular idea was pitched. Was it something you had pitched to Barney, or was it something that you you two had thought had thought of um, together? So, so it's something I I initially pitched to Barney as the kind of idea hit me, and then it's something we've been developing together, kind of in the background whilst working on the other Shiver releases. Mm -hmm. So. It was um I'd I'd been playing around with a lot of um solo RPG stuff. Um like kind of seeing how popular it'd gotten kind of during the pandemic and uh, having a lot of friends in the kind of TTRPG community like recommending different ones to me and playing different ones. And it got my kind of head spinning about not kind of seeing like a horror um solo RPG that was scratching a particular itch I was after. Um and I kind of got to thinking about um some of the things that used to spook me when I was like younger, like my early teens and as a kid. And I kind of got this idea in my head of, um, did you ever get one of those like chain emails or chain letters? Like when you were kids, like kind of very much like when the ring was in its like popularity of like, you know, pass this on to 10 people you die in seven days, like that kind of vibe. Not only did I get those, I started some of those. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so, um, so I, I kind of had like a vivid memory of those and the kind of, so I grew up, uh, so we, uh, I live there now actually, kind of, we moved back up there, but um, I grew up in the Midlands in, in the UK where there's kind of like a lot of old industrial towns, scrubland, um, lots of places when you're a kid, you know, that are kind of like abandoned um, that you can explore and are kind of a little bit strange, a little bit creepy. And I kind of wanted to, kind of combine that feeling of going on this slightly creepy singular adventure where you kind of have that creeping feeling that something has cursed you and you're trying to find a way to kind of banish it or figure out kind of what it is and that's where don't play this game came from um and like from what i've been doing so far i've been playing solo rpgs and a lot of them have a very strong journaling aspect like a, a journaling focus which I, I really like. I think it's a really strong foundation stone to a lot of um, solo RPGs. But what I wanted to capture was that feeling of kind of going outside of your front door, like kind of recording things in case like you didn't make it back um, and kind of expanding like beyond um, kind of sitting down and kind of writing uh, like a journal or a diary. I wanted to kind of get that sense of, be of something being more experiential. Um, which has kind of led to the way of like how I pitched it to Barney of that it's a found footage horror game where it's like Pokemon Go but you're trying to hunt down the Blair Witch before she kills you with a curse um, mm. and, and, that, and, and then from there basically kind of went over the mechanics and the ideas that I had with Barney and we started working and kind of fleshing um, kind of things out and now the and that's kind of where we've landed on with the quick start. And now I'm realizing it could be a bigger product and obviously launching it now through, through Kickstarter. Yeah. But it very much um, emerged from those like chain, those creepy chain letters, found footage, horror movies of my youth. And those kind of strange memories of like wandering down like abandoned railway tracks and the kind of quite these strange, creepy abandoned nature of some of the environments of my youth. I would say so. So, so that's kind of all the things that have melded in together um, to become the origins of the game. Yeah. And just out of curiosity, I and I know I know this had a bigger footprint in the UK than it did in the states, but mm -hmm. 
Growing up, w were you familiar at all with um, game books? Yes, we were. So, so I say, yeah, we were to rewind further. So the um, the fighting fantasy books were mm -hmm. books that me and Barney grew up on, like when we were kids. Um, what's the one that I remember the most? There's one that I... Creature of Havoc, that's the one that sticks out with the big, horrible, white, fluffy-maned monster on the front. Um, I remember that playing that one kind of like front to back. And when we were a bit younger, I can't find them now, but they used to, ones that were a big hit in the UK, but they're really difficult to find now, were the um, uh, scare, scare Yourself, like Goosebumps, I think they were called. Um, so it was basically like a choose your own adventure, like Goosebumps stories. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, they've kind of like disappeared into the ether. Like you can't, can't seem to find them anymore. Um, but yeah, but in terms of like those singular game books, yeah, the fighting fantasy, like Steve Jackson ones, um, and the um, the the kind of goosebumps ones were, yeah. were my kind of like early like solo things. Like you know, like you know, kind of like eight to fourteen years old, I'd say. And we we're playing those maybe a bit younger. Mm -hmm. And in my in my own experience, give, given what given the given the kind of environment that I, that I was in, there were plenty there were plenty of ways to spook in the in the forest. I told I told you before that growing up, werewolves scared me more than vampires ever could. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, most in part in part because um, stray stray wolves um, sightings weren't un weren't exactly uncommon. Where I was, <laughs> and <laughs> and um, in some in some parts of where of where I've grown up, it's it's considered a good idea to have have to have deer whistles attached to the side mirrors of of your vehicles, so you don't have to deal with deer pl playing freeze tag and you're when you're driving at night. Yeah, because <laughs> that that will hap that will happen where they'll just they'll be crossing the road they'll look at the headlights just sta just stare at you but yeah. it's too it's too late you end up bra you end up breaking hard and end up hitting it yeah and now you got to explain to the insurance agent why why there, why there's a deer shaped stamp on the on your um front <laughs> bumper <laughs> um which and of course of course um for, of course, further north, there's the whole issue with moose, which is worse. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> you've seen how you've no doubt seen how big those things can get. Oh, they're huge. Yeah. No. It's, um, I mean, we have deer here, like, but I say we we don't. It, it, they're kind of in much smaller enclaves here, like all kind of like on reserves and stuff. So you don't get as many deer accidents i would say like like yeah you, you don't get that kind of freeze tag element with deer as much here um but yes no seeing very various videos with with kind of like mooses causing havoc because they are just huge creatures aren't they they are massive yeah but the thing the thing i find interesting is there was there was that something like ring came out right came out right around that time where there was a growing amount of urban legends regarding cursed tapes, mm -hmm. or yeah. or ta or tapes that that you had gotten from places that you really shouldn't, mm. and I'm not going to say that 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 helped kick off the the idea of of analog horror, but it certainly helped sow the seeds for it. Oh, definitely. So I think, like, kind of, when it comes to analog horror and that idea of kind of a continuing technological curse, mm. like, really, really, you're kind of tracing it back to to Ringu, the the kind of Japanese original, I'd say, because it's kind of like around that era where you're kind of getting those folkloric legends, like, kind of coming to the fore um, a lot, so, and and I think that definitely trickled into Western culture quite hard. Um, and yeah, I think and, and like the big analog horror movie that we're kind of like seeing now, I think definitely owes a lot of its makeup to a lot of that, uh, obviously that early kind of, uh, kind of like 90s kind of horror that had that very VHS kind of cursed, slightly found footage edge to it. 
um, I, I feel. So, so yeah, no, definitely. I, I think I think it definitely does owe, 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 owe a tip of the hat at the very least, I would say. Yeah, well, when the, when the, the 80s was dominated by the slasher, nobody's going to deny that. And eventually, that was going to run its course, and something else was going to ha- was going to have to fill in the void. Mm. Um, that that happened to be it for a few for a few years, until um, until you had the you had the, you had something more psychological with with the with the original Saw, which I real I realized that that Saw kind of kind of got ridiculous in in a few years. It re- it really should have end- it really should have ended with its third entry, mm. but you look at the first one and it's almost like a chamber play. Oh yeah, like it's a it, it's for the vast majority it's like a neo noir two hander really with, with with kind of investigation and deadly traps scattered throughout it. But yeah, it's a very different beast to the sequels. But I think I'm very much with you. It kind of. For, for for kind of like a low budget piece of masterpiece filmmaking, saw the first saw film is is definitely up there. But I think yeah, you're right. It kind of as soon as more more money and ideas were kind of thrown at the franchise, it very quickly, in my opinion, just derailed itself. But, you yeah. know, you know how there's that cur- you know how there's that curse when it comes to lottery winners. I like I liken <laughs> it to that. Like yeah. some some people, they they win the lottery and they think they they think that they're supposed to be moving into a much bigger house, but they don't know how to properly maintain that bigger house, and it ends up in a worse state than it than it was before they came yeah. in. Exactly. Yeah, um, but a, but a, a curse that comes into the skies of a blessing. Yeah. Oh. Um, which is which is certainly in keeping with with it, with this because. <laughs> The idea is the is, as I understand it, the game is cursed, and it and if you don't play in seven days, something will happen to you. Yes, which is yes. very much wearing the influence of of Ring on its sleeve. Yeah, yeah. Was it, we haven't given it a specific day count, I, I would say, but it is very much the like kind of if you don't play with it then it will it will progressively get worse until you kind of play the game and do what it kind of wants you to do mm-hmm. um, is, is the idea that it's it's going to make the whole idea with the game is that it's a entity that's attached itself to the character that you're playing as and it's going to make terrible things kind of happen in that character's life and it will want you to record it in some way and basically build what we call a record um, of your experiences. Mm-hmm. Um, and that can be like journaling, photos, video recordings. So we're really leaning into the kind of multimedia aspects of it. And the Blair Witch element comes where we kind of say, you know, put this book down, go find the abandoned building, take a photo of it, and you could use that as an artifact. Um, mm-hmm. but, but the kind of whole idea is, is that um, it's through that recording is how you're playing the game. Um, and that if you want to try and not play out an event, um, then in terms of kind of the way you're recording your story, you're going to have to kind of think up of something like terrible that's going to happen to your character that is probably going to start nudging them um, towards playing. Um, but the whole idea with this is is that basically you play through these experiences, these horrible events, um, where you will end up, if you survive long enough, that is, facing the entity. Your character may live, your character may die, they may go mad. Mm. Um, but no matter what happens... The whole thing with this is is that your record then gets passed on to somebody else. So this can be a character that you make um, and pass it on to them, and you kind of start the experience over again uh, with a story as a foundation. So you can use somebody else's record as a foundation. Or say I'd played through the game and I'd finished a record, and you had the kind of core rule book with all the events in. I could then pass you my record and be like, "There you go, Mildred. I've I've been playing this, and you are now cursed." Mm-hmm. Um, and then you can use my record as a foundation stone to kind of start threading and carrying on elements of the story. So that's kind of where, like with this, where a big part of the interest of it really lies to me is that we're kind of taking something that is predominantly a solo experience, although there is going to be some rules and expansion kind of within the book talking about how you can involve 
kind of more of your friends and and make it a slightly more multiplayer experience as well. Um, but it is predominantly solo um, mm. in terms of the way that it's kind of intended to be played. Um, but the idea is is that through solo play, we're creating a multiplayer community, not necessarily a multiplayer experience, but one where um, people are engaging with the game, creating cursed records and passing it on and cursing other players, where they will then use that as a foundation to create their own records and it carries on and on and on. So what we're kind of hoping by, you know, as the community for this game eventually grows is to create a web of weird, interconnected, spooky stories um, that you can trace back to kind of like origin, like progenitor records of like where these curses seems to have begun. Um, and kind of in, like, yeah, encourage your community to kind of like build upon one another's creations whether those characters have survived or died um and and see what stories they can kind of tell and what revelations they can kind of be inspired by out of other people's works so so that but that's the kind of multiplayer aspect of it that we're really wanting to encourage yeah and of course though the other thing i could i couldn't help but notice is going th is going through the full range of dice because a lot of a lot of solo or journaling games will tend to will tend to stick to one particular st type of die and and nothing else whereas you're mm. using the full range up to d100 yeah mm. yeah so, 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 so the reason for that is is we we enjoyed the kind of variety obviously of like using, using all the different role play dice but mechanically it opens up a lot of doors um that um I mean, it, it means it, what it's allowed us to do is um, in terms of more acutely design how you move through the events. So just to clarify, so the, so the quick start that you can get kind of from the website for Don't Play This Game um, is a linear story where you play through 10 events in order. The core book is not going to be like that. So, so what it will do is, is you will play through an event and it will ask you to roll a, di a dice of a certain size um, in order to kind of move through the book. Um, and basically kind of what it's allowed us to do is, is one of the things that I've been trying to crack kind of with solo RPG stuff, um, is particularly this of making it feel like you're playing a fan for a horror movie, is pacing um, and kind of the types of events that you land on. So what I've been trying to do is bracket events into the beats of like a found footage horror movie and then using the maths behind the scenes with what dice that you roll to play around the probability of like you landing slightly further ahead um, and, and and kind of landing into a new bracket when you sh you know um, the pacing like should be kind of pushing you into a new bracket and playing it that way. I mean, obviously that there's still that element of randomization, but it's opened up that that area of pacing for us on that side. There's also an element of um, we really like the idea of um, kind of the whole thing with this. I think like when you're doing solo RPGs is that it absolutely lives and dies by meaningful choices and heavy consequences, especially for horror. And for us, it's um, having the choice to sacrifice um, things, whether that's resources or friends or, or any um, artifacts or any of the other things um, that you kind of, you'll find yourself tracking whilst playing Don't Play This Game. Um, to like upgrade your dice size, like say you're fighting something and you need to like deal it a certain amount of damage, for example, and we say roll roll a d4, but sacrifice something, um, you know, sacrifice a resource and you can upgrade it, um, you know, so break your torch, that's one of your resources, by smashing it over the monster's head and you can up it to a d8, but you lose that resource, which may be, you know, absolutely necessary where you find yourself lost in the dark later in the story. So that that's why we wanted to kind of have those varying die sizes, is that, um, and it's all linked to um, kind of the pacing of the game, kind of on the behind the scenes sides of the game, but then also increasing die size through choice, consequence, and sacrifice um, in order to kind of make it a more enriching experience where the player's choices really truly matter. Mm -hmm. The the. Uh... The other thing that I could I couldn't help but notice is the event system, mm. and 
because I do because I do see the the listed events that were in the de in the demo, and I'm curious if um if in the full book you have a you have you have a de a wi a wider am a wider amount of of events that can that can potentially happen, you know, go going from one to the other in a very um choose your own adventure kind of way. Oh, absolutely. So, so, so that's what I'm talking about with the very dice size in terms of when we're talking about pacing as well. There, mm -hmm. there is a, a massive element of randomization as well. So, when the kind of full book's finished, we pr predict it's going to be very, pretty much near impossible to be kind of landing on the same experience twice. Um, like, it, it, there's going to be a lot of variety and options that kind of always keep moving forward. Um, the ending of the quick start, for example, is just one entity or like one version of the entity that you can face um as you kind of end in different areas you may find yourself landing on different strands that take you to different versions of like a showdown with the entity that work very differently that prey on different fears um for example like some will be more confrontational some of them will be more psychological um so yes in in the final game there'll be a, m a vastly expanded amount of um, options um, for events that will fill out those kind of those beats that I was talking about earlier to kind of pace out the game. Mm -hmm. So within that, within that, um, would it be fair of me to say that you're that there's no there's no hard and fast thing about what the entity is? Yeah, I, I I would say so. It's the entity to me is kind of every kind of folkloric boogeyman that you can kind of think of. But but for me, it's very much that not not kind of like medieval mythic kind of boogeyman. I'm thinking more like you know the you know like the Blair Witch that lives in the woods. The you know the thing that's in the kind of abandoned house on the hill in your local town it's for me the entity is that little shard of darkness that sits in a community that everyone knows about but doesn't necessarily know what to do and never really knows fully whether or not it's real or how much of it's based on truth so i'd say that's what the entity is to me but but in terms of that it's that's very very broad and that's kind of my intention with it is to be um as as is the way with solo RPGs, is that you're trans kind of transmitting a lot of of kind of your, your own story onto this. It's built to encourage that, so the entity can kind of become whatever is ref the antagonist becomes reflective of the story that you're telling um, through the mechanics. Mm -hmm. Now, we in a lot of in a lot of games, I've talked I've talked about the what I call the Rome factor. You know, all mm. all roads lead to Rome because yeah. I don't. I'd say I I'd, I'd say this start. I'd say this started in the not in the nineties, le leading into the two thousands. This idea of instead of a bunch of subsystems that you have a unified mechanic, though. I think in in this case the. Would it be fair of me to say that the die rolling is specific to each event that triggers it? Like there, there isn't a unified approach as far as what the most common die roll is going to be. Yeah, no, it's it's, it's always specific to the event. Um, so, so, so yeah, it, it's it's there isn't kind of like your always base starting point is a d6 or a d4. It's going to vary very much depending on what the event kind of wants from you. Um, so yeah, so so there's there's a lot of kind of flexibility and. Surprise! I'd say there. Um, yeah, we we don't kind of land on one core dice and then branch out from there. Yeah. Of course, I did appreciate the the almost journal like approach that the writing has within it, as if you're reading somebody else's um, particular notes when it comes to this game. When it comes to the game, and I'm guessing oh, that's going to be carried through carried through into the full book. Yes, that was one of the biggest challenges actually with this was kind of finding the interesting like um, mode of address. But this is very different from like it's the way I found with with everything else that um, that often like rules uh, kind of in books tend to be in a very like neutral voice. Mm -hmm. um, but with this, we wanted people to feel immersed as soon as soon as you get past the safety tools. Like we want you to feel kind of just completely immersed as soon as you start playing and reading the rules. So yeah, so so that was kind of 
the decision we landed on of like someone who's played the game has got through it um and it's also a little bit of an unreliable narrator as well like you don't really know how much you should actually really trust what they are saying to kind of start putting you at uh, kind of unease but then you also have this dual narrator of when the entity interrupts and you get the font changes and it jumps in and kind of takes over and hijacks the book as well um because you have the entity telling you what to do and what's happening um but then you have this poor cursed person in the background who's writing the other corners of the book trying to help keep you alive or so you think um yeah what you think of that person and what their intentions are is completely up to you when you read the book mm -hmm. um it is interesting that you brought up blair witch earlier since well the the film blair, the film itself is all right the the interesting part was how the film how the film got made um, Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. yeah completely agree. For start for starters, it was made it it was made at just the right time to pull that kind of thing off. But mm. the other thing I found interesting was when they were when they were cat when they were doing casting, they specifically wanted people who had an improv background. And mm. if if they end up hesitating to try and remember a certain line, um, their name would be taken off the list. That's how they were. There was an extreme yeah. dedication to that degree of immersion. Yeah. And, well, the. It's one of those things. W that sort of. That sort of horror can only really work once because, well, nobody talks about the sequel to Blair Witch. And. Yeah. The, <laughs> um, the same thing goes with, say, Paranormal Activity, which I'd say is. I'd say is one of the. One of the rare sta one of the rare standouts when people st when people tried to do the whole found footage thing. Mm. Oh. Yeah, pa paranormal activity is interesting cause it, cause, so, so that's one that I grew up with as a teen, with it being in the cinema, mm -hmm. like the paranormal activity, and I remember the kind of furore around it. And I think for me personally, like um, I think the the marketing and, and the way that Blair Witch handled itself in terms of releasing the film was very very clever and very different from Paranormal Activity um, but ultimately I think the film's not aged incredibly well uh, whilst for me like Paranormal Activity is, it kind of stands out a little bit more and I think works a little bit better has a bit more staying power um, in, in some degrees um, and then honestly you can kind of run through and pick and choose like which ones of the sequels are good i'm partial i hate the second one but i'm partial to the third one um when it comes to paranormal activity it's a real mishmash of a series from the first one on um but yeah how how the first very much like the very which how the first paranormal activity got made was fascinating of a guy taking out like a thirty thousand dollar loan to do up his house and having a very focused improv um, kind of background with it and it's yeah no it's very compelling in terms of just how something on such a tiny budget managed to dominate the box office for so long mm -hmm. and because because i would you and you and i are in the same relative age and we had both kind of went kind of went through that fixation that a lot of people had with um f with found footage mm. as, far, as far as horror and a lot of how Frank, frankly, a lot of people misunderstood what ma what made it work because so mm. many people thought so many people thought that in order to make things scary, you had to do you had to shake the camera about which that doesn't make things scary. It just makes people want to want to want to reach for the bin bag. Yeah, just give a motion sickness. Yeah, <laughs> and um, I've I've freak even even in other genres, I frequently stated whoever does whoever whoever came up with the idea of uh, of shaking of shaking the camera to imply intensity i want that person um flogged <laughs> yeah <laughs> like flo old old school flogged in the pub in the public square put them on stocks so, and everybody throw tomatoes at them <laughs> uh, or if or if we're close if we're closer to the harbor maybe we can have them keel hauled <laughs> extreme you might say i say the punishment should fit the crime yeah <laughs> and if you're going to give hundreds of hundreds if not thousands of people motion sickness from that from that shaky cam shit <laughs> then then this is then I'd say, I'd say the punishment is deserved 
but yeah, a lot. Of, what end, whenever whenever something ends up breaking out like that, you have a lot of people um, misunderstanding what made it work. Mm. Um, and found footage found footage is no exception. I'd I'd say th- throughout the two thousands, a lot of people tried it and didn't understand it because they thought they thought they fo- they hyper focused on the camera part and. As odd as this may sound, it didn't it didn't really pick back up until you until you started having things like Slenderman or Mar- or Marble Hornets, mm, which yeah. more to, which were taking advantage of how easier it was to get cameras and get and get recording equipment and instead instead of lamenting that everybody has this kind of thing, take it, taking advantage of it by having it be something that seems normal but there's more and more things that are off the more you watch say marble hornets or everyman hybrid mm. um, and it, it it is something to consider with this, with this consi- considering how analog horror is the mo- is the motif within this oh absolutely yeah i'm i'm th- this is one of the things i think i'm most excited about to see with the game is seeing the multimedia approach that people are take that are going to take with this. Because I mean, we've been talking to various people who are kind of working on some actual play content with this, and like some people are going like the very traditional like kind of journaling way and doing illustrations. We have someone who um, is very into Polaroid photography, um, and is kind of using like uh, their Polaroid camera as a way of like kind of generating most of their artifacts. People wanting to do video. Um, some of us going, you know, like camping in the woods and, you know, taking a little audio recorder with them or using the memo app on their phone. Mm-hmm. Um, there, there, there really is so many ways to play this game and contribute towards it, whether it's a, you know, a text chain on Discord or, or through your phone um, and all of these various, like, bits of technology. So I think that's kind of, like, really kind of, like, what kind of dilutes down to the core of a lot of the fan footage kind of horror stuff it's that interfacing kind of with technology and different mediums mm-hmm. uh, and I think that's one of the things that excites me the most with this because I think you 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 could like some people are doing pick like one of these mediums and run with it and make your own small found footage movie um, using the book as a prompt um, to kind of like guide you through and almost like help you write your script for it for like a solo character um, or um, in a more kind of interesting turn I think you can create like a multimedia scrapbook that basically becomes your record so it's not just a you may have a journal but you may have video files you may have audio files photos um, a real cornucopia of spooky things that someone has to kind of read and delve into and figure out where what goes where um, and kind of really adds to that mystery element. I think the more mediums you throw at it, mm-hmm. and just out of cu- just out of pure um, curiosity, have you ever heard of the Mystery Flesh Pit National Park? Since we you mentioned scrapbooking earlier, I haven't. Sorry, what was that? Mi- mis- mystery Flesh Pit National Park. Yeah. No, no, I've I've not heard of that. Because that is that is a that is a great example of of this sort of that sort of collective scrapbooking into an idea. Mm, okay. Um, because it started out as as essentially an archive that was de- that was detailing the, a this this weird well flesh pit in the mid, in the middle of. Um, in 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 the in the middle of midwest of the midwestern United States, okay, but and and just ex, and just exploring the, uh, just exploring the idea of it with old with old photos of of a park that doesn't exist. Um, I sent you a li- I sent you a link to to the original website where the whole thing got started. Oh, fantastic! Yes, I will absolutely check this out this is very much my jam mm-hmm. um, somebody di- somebody did adapt it into TTRPG form using the cipher system that um, 
that that was a Kickstarter from earlier in the year. Oh, but it, okay. but it is it is a very inter- is a very interesting beast. Mm. And and some there were some Q and A's with it, and there there was a similar thing with um, Everyman Hybrid, where the, where a wiki ended up getting setting set up as people were deciphering the mystery that was going on with each um, particular short. Mm. Yeah. And what's very what's interesting about the. Uh, about this whole about this whole approach is kind of creating that co- that collective I guess it, I guess internet sleuthing would be the, would be the way to put it when you have all of this information and people independently of each of each other not not at, not creating some full on group but kind of accidenting in into ever into everybody putting all their notes together oh yeah yeah no it's, it, it's the kind of beauty of like someone can broadly take somebody's record for example and take large amounts of it wholesale and create a sequel to it almost with their own work or they could take one small granular detail that they find interesting and then that becomes the link to their record so it can really people can really build things the way that they want and connect things the way that they want but yeah but I'm, I'm very much with you I love that um, kind of strange kind of patchwork kind of quilts that you kind of see emerge through like these big kind of community projects really where, where you see um, kind of these like wikis of horror in a way that emerge um, of people yeah try, trying to like kind of um, what's the word I'm looking for basically like creating a red string board of conspiracy and mystery together and trying to like connect the string from one thing to the other um, is kind of how I see it in my head um, like a conspiracy board <laughs> is, um, but where where kind of people's posts and ideas um, slowly begin to kind of be strung together, creating a very complex and maddening web. Mm-hmm. And in the if I had to, if I had to use a real world example of the of this kind of thing, um, ta- this kind of thing taking place, mm. I would say. The I would say the trash can scandal when it came to the Houston Astros, where, and this this what I'm going I'm going to try my best to to summarize what was going on. People because of the fact that MLB puts up has for the last few years put up all, put up full games on YouTube. People were yeah. noticing these weird no, these weird um, noises. Um, at 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 um home games for the Houston Astros, and the and and every and it started with just a couple of people noticing why why does it sound like there's somebody banging a trash can, <laughs> and the, and then people ended up pouring through hours upon hours of games, and figure mm. and were able to figure out patterns where certain <laughs> certain. Like it, like if if it gets if it gets banged twice, then that means somebody was pitching a slider or th- things like that. It it ended up it ended up revealing itself to be this elaborate um, sign stealing scheme that the Astros had, and what and they got thrown the book at um, o- over. Okay, oh, interesting. Because basic basically the. Ca- the catcher in baseball has certain hand signals that the only person who's supposed to be able to see that is the pitcher, basically basically yeah. signaling ahead what sort of pitch to use. You know, whether a curveball, whether a slider, whether a fastball, whether yeah. whether a, sc- a screwball. Although nobody really does screwballs anymore. Yeah. And the Astros had somebody had somebody looking at that and in and using these trash can signals to signal ahead to the batter. And the the only reason that the MLB was able to throw the book throw the book at them over this is because is because hundreds of people were submitting were submitting material demonstrating this pattern. Mm, yeah. It's so it's an it's an it's an interesting parallel to th- to this kind of thing, and just sh- and just showing that col- that collective sleuthing 
um, being done mm-hmm. in real time. Of course, if I want to go further back, we could look up we could look up the um, the greatest dumb game of hide and seek that was the <laughs> that was the Shia LaBeouf saga. <laughs> no, it's like okay, okay. They keep tr- they keep trolling my art exhibit they my art exhibit in in the middle of New York. Should have known should have known better, honestly. <laughs> so so I'll move I'll move it elsewhere. Then they troll it again. Then I'll I'll move it to a flag in the middle of nowhere, and people are looking at star charts to figure out where it is and <laughs> and steal my damn flag. And it's not like a specific group got together and like and was like, okay, let's mess with Shia LaBeouf. No, F, no, a bunch of people um, did did so individually, and it just it just combined to the greatest game of capture the flag we've ever seen. Yeah, it's it, it's interesting how pockets of community can kind of pop up overnight over very niche, very specific. So sometimes, like yeah, very funny and and odd things. Um, but yeah, no, it, it's, and and, I, it's, and uh, around kind of creepy things as well. I remember, um, so I remember growing up on Marvel Hornets, and the amount of discourse about that as like a piece of media of people trying to figure out what was going on, and like you know, like looking at stuff in the background, like you know, drawing links to previous episodes, and that kind of sleuthing. But yeah, no, I I love that, and I really hope that that is. Um, where people get to with don't play this game, interacting with one another's work that they've created, like their own creations, um, using the kind of rule set as that jumping off point. I look at this kind of thing as people learning from the mistakes of more artificial attempts to cr- to create quote unquote discourse. Mm. I'm looking right at you, lost. <laughs> <laughs> So, oh, don't get me started on JJ Abrams' mystery box. Um, my the Nick, we did an entire episode roasting JJ Abrams, and I have nicknamed him the California Roll of directors because <laughs> at least at least at least here in the at least here in the states, um, the California Roll is baby's first sushi. Ah. Uh. <laughs> Like it's the safe option. It's the lame option. It, it's, yeah, it's, it's like the most basic thing to order ever. Yeah. But it's a sushi. Okay. Yeah. Um, obviously, that's not that's not going to be the ca- that's not going to be the case. The further you get into in, into Japan, but oh, but over in this over in the states, that's kind of that's kind of the attitude that it that it's been given of just mm, yeah. you're. You're ordering it. You're ordering it because you because you want sushi, but you want something safe. You know. Yeah. I get. You know, it's it's like it's like saying that they it's like saying that they want to go out to they want to out, go out to get to get lunch and they end up going to some chain. Yeah. <laughs> which, I'm not. Which fair fair is fair. If you're hungry, you're hungry. But um, sometimes sometimes you can do better. But when it can, but there were a lot, but there were a lot of motifs and mo- and moments throughout Lost that felt like they, that felt like it was that mystery box that Abrams is so is so fond of that is only only there to spark what if conversations and then when the when the um, mystery is unveiled the people have worked themselves up about what it could be that. Whatever it actually is, ends up being over under underwhelming if it ever is revealed as such, since he does have a habit of just not following through. Yeah, it, it's it's ultimately I think you can kind of build so much hype around like a mystery box scenario where ultimately no matter what actually is within the box, it's never going to match what's in people's imaginations, and ultimately the box will always just feel like it's completely hollow. Mm-hmm. Like even if, even if there's if there's something in there, or even if there's not, it, it's going to feel hollow to people regardless. So it's it's yeah. I think th- th- this is the thing of that I I think with the structure of like the don't, don't play this game is that through looking at other people's records, you're kind of getting you know a crack of seeing like what's in 
that what was in the box for that person, what horror they encountered. Um, and you can kind of choose to build on that myth and slightly tweak the horror or grow it kind of in a, in a different direction or add another chapter kind of to its legacy. So it's... Um, the, the thing is, it's, it's like all good monster movies, isn't it, really? Like, where, where over-showing the creature is too much, but if you don't show the creature at all, people get real frustrated, and rightly so. Like, pe- people want that reveal, they want that confrontation, they they want that satisfaction of finally going head-to-head with the thing that is, you know, tormenting the characters that they love. Like, it's... it's it, you, you can't deny that, and expect people to be engaged and happy with the story that you're telling mm-hmm. there's been a there's been a discourse that's been nicknamed do you stat dragons that kind of that kind of goes into the same the same general area mm. of and the 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 mind because there's the mindset of if you st- if you um stat it then p- then players will think that they can um, overcome it through dire- through direct conflict. Mm. Um, I've al- I've always taken when it comes to me whenever when I've been asked that question I always take the approach of do I stat dragons yes do I stat them fairly no mm. yeah because it it's it all depends on kind of like narratively where you want antagonists to land at points in the story doesn't it mm. like it's it. It's because it's, it's something that we do. The kind of flipping away from uh, don't play this game for a moment. It's something we do with Shiver all the time. Is um, we design enemies in particular ways where early on in the story they are they are meant to be scary and make you want to run away um, by the way that they're statted. But then it's only for engaging with the story that um, there are mechanics that then begin to alter their stats and change kind of like what they are and how they interact with the players mm. um, so by the time you get to the showdown it's a difficult challenge, it's something scary I'm thinking of a slasher in particular because um, slashers are kind of the dragons of the horror universe I would say um, in many ways because they feel almost flipping unkillable um, that there, 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 there is still a chance it's still, it's still difficult it's still terrifying it's you know like going up against a dragon but um, through going through the story, learning more, doing that sleuthing, finding that mystery, you know, discovering that Jason drowned and maybe being in water is going to be his weakness, um, and kind of basically gearing yourselves toward a satisf- gearing yourselves towards a satisfying and rewarding showdown through your own um, kind of actions within the story as players is is much better rather than like. Oh, that dragon's got stats. That slasher's got stats. I'm gonna run at it and try and hit it until I think it's near death, or I just die in Act One. Because dying in Act One means there isn't really a story. It's it's you saw something bad, you tried to kill it, and you got killed. End of message. It's it's yeah. You don't get that narrative element. Pretty much. Pretty much. And. Within the now, with that in mind, what would what would you be shooting for as far as the page count for "Don't Play This Game"? So I I, I think kind of a, a rough estimations are looking at kind of anywhere between kind of one I think they're hovering around one sixty at the minute, but that could kind of creep up to more more towards like two forty, um, like where um, like the Shiver Core rulebook is. Um, th- this will be a slightly different format book, though. It'll be an A5 format book, or slightly lar- larger than A5. Um, so, it's like, because um, with the journaling kind of aspect of it, we wanted this book to be a bit more portable. Um, so, so, yeah, so we'll be going to an A5 format. Um, but, yeah, so, so, so probably about like 160 pages is, is our rough estimate from the number of events and things that we've, we've got planned out and mechanics and things. That's looking where the page count is roughly going to sit. Mm hmm. So, with the, and what would you be? Sh- I know you're. Pl- as I understand it, you guys are going to be launching the Kickstarter in, on um, early October. Yes, we are indeed. 
Um, do you plan on having that run for like th for like thirty days? Yes, yeah, so, so, so we'll be running from early October, I think October third, um, until November. Um, so, so it'll be early November, like third or fourth, and um, we'll be running for. So, so yeah, I'll be run, run, running for a thirty days. So, so our typical month-long campaigns that we've done before. Um, so we'll be running it through the entirety of the spooky season through October. Yeah, and I'll cer I'll certainly be keeping an eye on it. But Thank you very much. With the with that in my, with that in mind, I do want to give my sincere thanks to you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way back to my temple. Oh, thank you very much. Well, yeah. thank you so much for having us back. It's been great, great talking to you again. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As oh, I often say much. around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> And of course, a sincere thanks also goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!